I was stationed in the Coast Guard in the Aleutians, 1974-75, uh, and then on Kodiak Island, 75 to 76. And you'll see my subtitle here says, The Cradle of the Storms. And uh, thanks to our research librarian at UMFK, uh, Sophia Burden, I, I asked her if she could look for me. Um, the Cradle of the Storms was a book I read and I wondered where the origin of that title came from. And according to her research so far, uh, it seems to be in Aleutian, what they phrase as Aleutian imagery. In other words, it's kind of the, everybody kind of uses that phrase, uh, the origin of the winds, the cradle of the storm. So that's the origin of it. Uh, but what I want to do is talk about uh, a couple of things here. We'll look at geography, then we'll look at uh, the Aleut people will look at the discovery of the Aleutians by first the Russians and the Americans. And then I'll go into, um, uh, after the discovery, we'll do a little bit about World War II. If you're not aware, the Aleutians were invaded by Japan in 1942. And then we'll look at a little bit on the Coast Guard. Uh, and my service there, but not on me, but on what the Coast Guard has done there. And then I want to bring us up to date and we'll look at three villages out of the 13 villages in the Aleutians. We'll look at three villages close up. So that's the plan. So, uh, and uh, I'll stop at a few locations here in case you have questions, but if something's burning, let me know. So um, I'm trying to move the my picture here out of the way so I can see. There we go. So anyway, as you can see here, now I cannot see any of you, so you'll have to speak up if you have a question. But here you can see the North Pacific. Um, hopefully you can see my uh, cursor. And obviously the United States, Canada, and uh, Mexico just barely being seen, but most of North America except Mexico. So here's Southeast Alaska. And here is Anchorage with the red dot. Hopefully you can see that. The big island here is Kodiak. Then we come over to the Alaskan Peninsula. And where you see this first red dot here in the Aleutians, that's the first island of the Aleutians. That's Unimak Island. That's where I was stationed. It is the largest of the islands. And then it wiggles its way out 1,200 miles to Russian territory, the Commander Islands and then the Kamchipka Peninsula. So this is the area we're gonna look at with focus on the American islands. So a satellite image here showing the peninsula. I wanted to show you a Kodiak over here on the right. And then this is the peninsula, seeing a lot of volcanoes here, snow covered. And then right here is where the island starts. So this is Unimac Island. This blob in the middle here, this is Shishalden Volcano, other volcanoes on that island. And then the chain continues out into the clouds. So this is the area we're gonna be looking at. I wanna point out here though, the Aleut people, the Anangan people uh, probably lived up to about here on the peninsula. And we're gonna look at these, this little island chain. This is about where the Aleuts lived. And interestingly, I did not know this until researching this talk. These islands were actually inhabited from east to west six to 8,000 years ago. So the oldest settlements are here in the eastern portion, and the youngest settlements are out towards, towards uh, Russia, which is opposite of what I thought. So that was interesting. So they came across the land bridge, the Bering Land Bridge, which we'll see uh, the Bering area in just a second and made their way down here and then out. So anyway, how the Aleutians were formed, and here you can see the Commander Islands. Uh, this is the American property right here. And you have the North American plate and the Pacific plate is below it. And what happens is there's a subduction of the Pacific plate underneath the North American plate that pushes it up. And so that's where the earthquakes uh, tsunamis, um, or, uh, you know, volcanic activity originates from. So there is sedimentary material here and volcanic material. There's 57 volcanoes, 27 of which are active, 
The largest is Shishalden, right over here above the top of the V here. Uh, Shishalden Volcano, which is over 9,000 feet. And this is data from the Alaskan Volcanic Observatory. I want to also point out the Aleutian Trench here. So this dark area is the Aleutian Trench. It's uh, widest is about 100 miles, but it goes as deep as 25,000 feet uh, on the south side, on the Pacific side of the Aleutians. And notice here, this is much shallower, right? So we'll, we'll talk about the tsunami later on. Just to give you an idea overall, uh, if we look at the Pacific, the average depth is about 14,000 feet, not including the trench. In the Aleutian Basin, it gets to about 9,800 feet. This is where a lot of the fishing is done, but the crabbing, the crab fishing is mostly done on the shelf. If you've watched um, Deadliest Catch, you probably have seen them fishing in this area uh, because the average depth is about 500 feet. When you get up to the Bering Pass, uh, it's anywhere from 100 to 165 feet. So when we were in the time of glaciers, this was pretty dry. And that's what where the Bering Land Bridge uh, idea originates. So it's pretty shallow there. Uh, before we get to the weather, I want to point out one thing, and that is, even though this is a maritime environment, there's something else going on, and that is the uh, coastal currents are driving warmer water out across the Aleutians in what's called the Alaskan Stream. So they come up from the southeast, uh, go along the top of the Gulf of Alaska, and out along the Aleutians, out to uh, the um, Russian territory. So again, this is uh, oceanic or maritime, so it's sub polar. It's about 55 degrees north latitude. It's well below the Arctic Circle, uh, but it's subpolar oceanic. So it's pretty mild. The average July temperature is about 50 degrees. Uh, highs, like in 1974 or 75, we had a high of 73 degrees. That was a record. And the January temperature is just at freezing. So it's relatively cooler in the summer and relatively warmer in the winter. So we don't, it's much colder here than it is in the Aleutians in the wintertime. Hmm. The other thing that's interesting is it's darn dry in June through August on average, rel relatively dry. This place is very rainy and foggy, especially October to February with very intense storms. That's why they call it the cradle of the storms. There's always, usually more than 60 inches of rain and anywhere from 250 to 280 days a year it's foggy and rainy so it's it's um there's not always a clear view and when there's a sunny day boy people take advantage of it the winds average here about 15 miles an hour and there's always at least every month at least a 60 mile an hour gust somewhere so at about 55 degrees north latitude then during the winter solstice, it's about a seven hour day. And during the summer solstice, it's about a 17 hour day. So they're about an hour shorter in us, uh, than us in the winter time. So uh, here's the a chain going out to the commander islands. So there's 14 large islands, 55 smaller islands, many tiny islands, depending on who you read anywhere from 150 to 200 islands and um, that make up that chain, again, being pushed up by the subduction of the Pacific plate and that also forming, so you have sedimentary material from the being pushed up, but you also have volcanic activity and you can see these volcanoes that are, this is a Google Earth image and all the volcanoes are highlighted in white. So this is the American uh, side of the Aleutians, the majority of it. These island groups were named by the Russians when they first discovered them in 1740s. The near island group with the largest island at two. And the rat island group with the largest island, Kiska. We're gonna talk about these two islands, especially because of World War II, the Japanese actually took those islands. 
The largest, the one of the larger groups is the Andreoff, and this is the American spelling, Andreoff Islands, and somewhere right in here is ADAC, which was a Navy base, um, you know, prior to well past, well into the 70s, it was a Navy base with thousands of sailors there. Coast Guard was there. Uh, it's still a town, but it's not considered an Aleut village anymore. Then there's a small group of islands called the Island of the Four Mountains. It used to be called the Island of the Four Volcanoes. Now it's called the Island of the Four Mountains. Then we get into the chain that I know best, this group that I know best, which is called the Fox Islands with Unalaska, Umnak, Akatan, and Unimak. Unimak is the largest island in the chain. And Unalaska is both an island and a town, and it's the largest town in the Aleutians. Two other places to look at is the Puvlov Islands. The Aleuts never lived here until the Russians enslaved them there. And then, uh, and I'm not trying to beat up on the Russians. I'm not going to treat the Americans any different, trust me. Uh, the Shemungan Islands was where Bering first discovered the Aleut. Um, that was a peaceful encounter, and uh, there's still villages here in the Shemungan Islands, and this again is about as far east that the Aleuts uh, have lived uh, before uh, discovering by the Russians and Americans. So, excuse me, I'm going to pop a, a, a throat lozenge here, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, just to look at some of the topography, a lot of steep rocky approaches, a uh, very active currents offshore, especially on the Pacific side. The Pacific uh, has lent itself through history to be the the side that was most susceptible to tsunamis. But anyway, um, still a lot of current, whether you're on the Bering Sea side like this is, uh, this is the Unimac Pass. Here's a shot from July, and you can start to see some of the grass is starting to turn brown. Remember I said June, July, August is kind of the dry period. So once you get into August, this is going to be brown. And off in the distance, this is all the same island you're seeing. This is Unimac Island. Uh, it looks flat, but there is ravine after ravine after ravine here. So if you were traveling across here to be going up and down, there's one right here in front of us further out. There's ravine after ravine. And what you're seeing here in the distance, uh, uh, Shishalden Volcano is covered a little bit here. It's a little hard to see because of the cloud, but that's Shishalden Volcano. We'll see a better shot later on. And this is a caldera. It's a collapsed volcano. So imagine how large that was. And then this is a um, more localized volcano that's on the west end of the island, Copagromni. And then this is the other parts of the island. You'll see better pictures here uh, of those distant volcanoes in a little bit. This Unimac Island is about 80 miles long, so this volcano is in the middle of the island, and it's about 20 to 30 miles wide. Oh. Hmm. Um, apologies for this slide that I took and scanned. I wanted to show you this because I'm up at my station looking south to the Pacific Ocean, off in the distance here. But I wanted you to see this because this is an August shot. You can see how brown it is. There are cinder beaches. And this is a lava formation that probably occurred 1964. This was formed in 1964. This is the Unimac Pass. And the reason this is important is the second and third lighthouse in Alaska were built here because this is the first navigable pass between the Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea. So it's a pretty important navigation point for mariners. But we'll be looking at some close-ups of the lava field. But on the edge of this, you can't see it, are tons of birds breeding there uh, during the breeding season. Lots of birds in this country. This is the Bering Sea side. So I'm on this, um, kind of overlooking the beach, looking due west. This is the Bering Sea to the right. And this is the Cinder Beach. So this kind of shows you a lot of that topography. Um, I'm looking due south. This is a December shot. You can see there's not a lot of snow because of the wind. Uh, moves a lot of the snow off. So the caribou will come out here in the wintertime. That's the only time I would get to see them. 
but this is a t for me to snowshoe i actually would have to go a couple miles into the foothills just to snowshoe in december uh, january gets a little bit better but anyway you can see what some of these drainage ravines look like that's a, a larger one we used to call this first river i don't think that's an official name it may be unnamed so this is tundra. Now, no offense to my my colleagues here, or former teachers, but I remember being taught as a schoolboy that a tundra was a frozen wasteland. And after living there uh, a year, I thought, boy, that is the worst definition because this place in the spring is teeming with insects and birds. It's just amazing. And there are three kinds of... Um, well, I guess I have four categories here. There's three types of tundra. There's the predominant tundra, which is the crowberry. Then you get up several hundred feet uh, in elevation and you get the alpine. And then where there's wetland, it's what they call the wet tundra. So um, the predominant one is the crowberry and that's what you're seeing here is crowberry. There's also beach ridges where there's a lot of sedge and, and grasses and such. Uh, lakes and streams have their own kind of uh, habitat with some protected areas there uh, giving rise to a little bit of woody shrub like an alder and a willow that don't get very big. Uh, and there are no trees here, right? This is treeless except where maybe the Navy had planted some on ADAC. And then there's also the reefs that so we can't forget about the reefs. These are offshore and um, I don't know if you've ever seen any pictures. I have not been in them, but I've seen pictures of these reefs. Uh, they're, they're these large, uh, like kelp uh, forest, and they're teeming with life, and we'll come back to them in just a little bit. So on the crowberry tundra uh, are going to be crowberry, lichen, moss, blueberry, cranberries, lupins, uh, sedge, reed grass, lots of flowers. In fact, some of these that you'll recognize, and again, willow and alders, where there's protection uh, from the wind. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I could not find out what island this was, and I have to be careful here because, especially if this is, we're recording this, uh, to watch for copyright. Uh, so I had no problem with the copyright, but I couldn't find where this was. But here you can see crowberry tundra, and you all recognize fireweed, and then here's some reed grass on that beach ridge. And then up here would be um, that alpine tundra. Uh, one of my lousy shots again, but it shows you that in the spring there are lots of flowers. And uh, this is looking kind of west and south to two other islands on the other side. This is the Unimac Pass, the water body you're seeing left to right. So some fireweed here on the left. On the top right is wild geranium. And then another one of my lousy shots, <laughs> little Kodak Instamatic apparently, didn't work too well. But you can see some lichen here. And believe it or not, this is a rhododendron, uh, which I only discovered recently uh, when trying to find pictures and plants. But that is, believe it or not, a rhododendron. Now, what you're seeing here is the old lava flat that formed um, before this picture was taken, 10 or 11 years before this photograph was taken. So things come into the lava pretty quick. To me, a decade is, is, is pretty quick for just rock and then supporting uh, moss and then uh, lichen. And the lichen is a, and, and other plants are pretty important to the caribou. So that leads us into wildlife. And like I mentioned, there's tons of birds. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about marine life. Most of the land mammal, mammals are introduced, except on the island I was on, I got blessed because I got the biggest and the most wildlife filled island because it's so close to the mainland. But there's tons of insects here. And unfortunately, I had not had botany, uh, didn't know much about plants or insects at the time. I really wish. I had, but a lot of animals were introduced, uh, fox, caribou, cattle, rats came in on ships. Squirrels we'll talk about, this is the Arctic squirrel got moved out uh, to help with fox, food for fox, and then mice. 
So those are all introduced. But I want to focus first on the seabird colonies because according to the World Wildlife Fund, this, it's, this is a quote, the colonies of extraordinary size and global importance. On the Puivloff Islands, those two big islands alone, there are three million seabirds that breed there. And that's just one set of islands. So there are so many there. In fact, uh, one species of shearwater, uh, there's two or 300,000 of just that species and it's the only place they breed. So ecologically, it's, this is very important habitat. Uh, so anyway, here's a couple of photographs I was able to get copyright free. And this uh, least ocklet, uh, I've cut out two of her chicks that are over on the left. And then this is a really cool site to see where you have shearwaters or other birds in mass out on when the sea is calm. Uh, there's a lot of pictures on the internet where you see these this sea of birds and then you have a whale uh, a, a fluke coming up. Uh, it's pretty cool. So there's uh, close to 40 species of marine birds that breed up here and that are here, um, especially during the breeding season. And anywhere there's rock, you're going to see something like this. Now, on my island where I was, and I was limited because this is a wilderness area, so it's foot travel except on business, right? So most of that lava bed, lava flat that we had, which ended pretty sharp, there were little pockets where, you know, you'd have one nest, not more than two, but lots of birds, especially puffins. There's three species of puffins up here. There's over 10 species. Well, there's 10 species, and they have one during an Audubon survey. They weren't sure if it was a new species or not, so I put a question mark where you see a question mark, but at least 10 species of gull three puffins. So there's a lot of seabirds up here. There's also a lot of migratory uh, shorebirds like we would have here, plovers and dowagers and etc. And then the land birds, which I was more familiar with, uh, saw a lot of ravens, ptarmigan, bald eagles. And then where you have some ponds and water, you'll have ducks and geese. Uh, hawks are there, even a couple of songbirds. Uh, and there's others that I just don't know, didn't didn't know to put on here. But uh, anyway, I do not recall hearing or seeing songbirds, but I did see raven, bald eagle, ptarmigan. Um, they weren't uncommon. So for the fishermen out there, and I know there's quite a few of you, uh, salmon, halibut, cod, pollock are uh, common. And of course, there's you know four or five species of salmon. Uh, this is the island I was on. I was over here on the northwest corner, but we did not have any salmon streams or, or decent fishing here. And I didn't try offshore because of the kelp beds. I didn't bother. But at any rate, um, you can see the salmon streams and then out on the peninsula, tons of it. But uh, since I knew there were going to be a number of fisher people here, I did do some research and found that in the early 2000s, they did a survey of 178 lakes on 13 islands and found seven species, five of which were freshwater species. Uh, so anyway, I'll read this real quick. Um, Coho salmon and Dolly Varden, those are both androgynous. So that means that they're at sea and they come in to spawn uh, in, in, um, in lakes and ponds. But rainbow trout is there. Uh, there's two species of stickleback. There's a sculpin uh, and there's a blackfish. The sculpin's like a bottom feeder and then blackfish. So those are, I I'm, know I'm, I'm doing marine here, but I thought for those of you that like to fish, you might be interested. Continuing with marine life, I want to talk about invertebrates. And here you have uh, sea slug, sea urchins, and mussels. And these were really important to uh, feed other marine life, especially sea otters. And those were the most fun to watch, um, where they would pick a rock, put it on their chest while they're floating, and they'll be cracking uh, shells. Uh, but there's seals, sea lions. There's about five or five species of whale up there. 
the killer whale I'm sure you're all familiar with. I'll talk about the gray whale in just a second. But I remember in about 2012, or I read an article that was from 2012 that said there was a decline in the kelp beds off of the islands, and they were trying to figure out what it was. And here it turns out that there's been so much overfishing that the killer whales were coming closer to shore and taking out a lot of sea otters, which were then allowing more sea urchins to feed on the kelp forest, and they were causing a decline in that. And I haven't found anything, uh, any data to see what had happened since. So I'm sorry I can't follow up on that story. I couldn't find anything. I do want to talk about the gray whale because this is actually the first whale, believe it or not, even though I grew up on the East Coast, on the coast of New Jersey, dolphins and such I saw all the time, but I didn't see whales often. But uh, once I was in Alaska, the gray whale I did see, and the, the Atlantic gray whale is extinct. And there's two populations of gray whale in the Pacific, eastern and western. The eastern population is doing very well. Western population, not as well. So um, the gray whale, 39 feet to 49 feet. The, the typical is 39 feet, 60,000 pounds. But what's interesting is they'll feed up in uh, Alaskan waters and then work their way down in the deep winter. They'll do their calving down in uh, Baja and then work their way back up. So I got pretty close to these. Uh, so here's a couple of shots. And what's amazing is these are December photographs. And this is pretty revealing because what you're seeing here is a tail fluke. They, they are very curious and they come very close to boats and to shore and they feed in very shallow water. They turn on their side and they scoop up the bottom and they're filter feeders. So one of the, reasons that they were close to extinction was because they're so curious they come right up right up to boats so you can see i'm out on the rocks this isn't 20 yards away uh from me so anyway that's the gray whale really interesting uh creatures uh very quickly i'll just mention again most mammals were introduced there's a question about ground squirrels that i'll talk about the rats we know came in on on ships as recently as World War II, fox were stocked by the Russians and as late as 1945 for their for their fur or belts. And caribou were released on ADAC, but now are in at least one or two other islands uh, uh, starting in the 50s and then uh, later. And what it is is caribou were released there by Navy men because they wanted to hunt. So uh, there are a couple of caribou populations on other islands that were introduced uh, for similar reasons, for meat uh, more than hunting, actually. So there are a few land mammals that are uh, unique or endemic to the Aleutians. It's thought that they got geographically isolated once the glacier, once the ice sheets melted during glaciation period. Uh, the last ice age is what I'm trying to say. But the ground squirrel, this is a native range of the ground squirrel, and there's question on whether some of these outer populations were introduced because there are records of them being introduced to islands to help feed the fox. Most of the fox who were introduced were introduced where their bird colonies were, and the Russians wanted the pelts. Um, we'll come back to, to fur trade in, in a little bit here because that's what drove a lot of the discovery. Uh, now, as I said, I was blessed because I was on the largest island, Unimac, which is the first island, which is so close to the mainland that we had almost every species of mammal that was on the mainland. The only problem is where I was was heavily volcanic, so I didn't get to see a lot of the species that would be over where there's more uh, wetland and lakes and ponds in the uh, central and western part of the islands. But... We saw caribou, again, they would come out in the wintertime because, again, here's a December shot, the December, January, February. The wind is blowing here so much that the caribou can get at browse, so they'll feed on whatever they can get, lichens, grass, sedge. Um, I did see the tail of a wolf, <laughs> and we did have brown bear, 
Uh, but there's 25 species of mammals uh, on the island. Uh, here, I'm out on the lava flats in July of 74, and you can see uh, Alaskan brown here. We had dogs because the dogs would warn us if uh, the bears were nearby. This is one of two cubs that would come to our station all the time. We had to incinerate our garbage because they could smell the garbage. And if we buried it, it would just be a draw for animals. But they would come to the garbage room door where we had an incinerator. We had to incinerate that. And the dogs would warn us. But this is Kissinger. We had two cubs. There was Nixon and Kissinger. They're about 250 pounds, two-year-old. So that's Kissinger. Uh, there was hunting on the west, east end of the island. It's all by uh, permitting through uh, fishing game uh, for bear and for wolf. I don't know if it's still going on or how how that works, but there's a number of different guides. This is rrhunting.com, but there are a number of people that live in the peninsula and on a couple of the islands that do guide to hunt. So. Um, and then fox, of course, fox were introduced. Now this is on Unimac Island, so I don't know uh, if this was native or introduced. I suspected it was introduced. That's what I was told, but I'm not sure. Off in the distance here, so this is Scotch cap light, which we'll talk about later briefly. And you're seeing uh, uh, Amungan and Tanaga Islands over here. Uh, this is the Unimac Pass, the bearing uh, the Pacific Ocean is to the left. And this was the second lighthouse built in Alaska around 1903, I believe. So, any questions? How long were you on that, on the uh, Unimac Island? Uh, for a year. So just one year, we had one year of duty, and then we would get an extra 30 days off because it was pretty isolated. We could, if you had the money, you could fly off. and But it was so expensive to fly there that nobody, we had a, one of the guys I was with, he was from Tennessee, I believe. His mother died. He couldn't even afford to go home for the funeral. It was just too expensive. We would, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but uh, we would get a supply ship once a year. And if we were lucky, a plane would come every two weeks with fresh milk, eggs, and mail. So when when the plane came in, everybody got their mail. It was you were given time off, so it was a big deal. You never went back. Pardon me. You never went back. I'd love to go back, but no, I haven't. And the it's basically a wilderness area, and the only way to get in there now is by boat. Other questions? Yes. How does it feel to walk on cinder ash? Uh, honestly, I didn't do that because I was on the uh, I was on a lava that was already cold ten years, so I haven't really walked on any of the. Oh, oh, I see. The cinder beach is what you're probably referring to. Um, that was actually pretty cool, and it's so small that you would think it was sand, but it's black. And we did a, that's where we spent a lot of our free time. Um, I did a lot of hiking. And um, with a, a long day in the summertime, I could get 20 miles in. So, um, but we would usually go in groups and we weren't allowed to hike without carrying at least a 30 caliber rifle uh, or, or more. And it was best to be traveling with somebody. But never had any trouble. Any bears we ever encountered went the other way. Uh, we tried to do nothing. You know, we didn't. We tried to be smart about food and things like that. Anything else? So what I want to do now is this is what I had to research because I really didn't know too much. I've only really met two uh, Aleut people. Uh, one gentleman that was came to our station to do some work. And then the next year on Kodiak, I met some Aleut folk. And anyway, their proper name is Unangan. Uh, and this is spelled three different ways, but the, the there's also spelling with the X. One is singular, one is plural. And like I said, uh, they populated the Aleutian Islands from the east to the west. So they came down the peninsula 
and then populated the islands that way. So on the eastern end of the island, their, their, their villages were and sites are about 8,000 years old. But one of the things to keep in mind about these islands, these island groups particularly, is they're very isolated. And so uh, I'm, I was reading, I was able to get this book uh, on the Aleutian Islands uh, by, uh, it's a thesis by John Hall that, that I learned quite a bit about. And one of the things he said is that um, they were so isolated that this island group or that island group or that island may have a completely different culture and practices and beliefs than another island group. And we know that there was at least three dialects of Aleut. One is extinct. Um, one, the Eastern dialect is probably the one that's the most intact. There's probably only five, 105 to 150 people that speak it anymore. Uh, and we'll talk about that. But uh, the thing I want to stress here is these people had a lot of different cultural practices from island group to island group. So it's really interesting. So again, the older settlements were the ones in the eastern part of the Aleutians. The youngest ones, about 6,000 years, would be out on the far end at the west end towards Russia. So there we go. How did they make their living? Now, this is pre-Russia, right? So how did they make their living? Well, they hunted, they whaled, they fished, they went after seals, sea otters, sea lions, whales. Occasionally, a walrus would come down, and they would get that. And they have developed this, uh, I'm going to try this, oh, yeah, ikiak. So ikiaks is the Aleut word for the Aleutian kayak that they developed. Uh, we'll talk, we're gonna see a picture of it in a, in a second. Uh, the women uh, also hunted birds, uh, collected berries, mollusk, uh, plants. They did a lot of weaving. They made baskets from grass. Uh, the clothing that they made is absolutely remarkable. Uh, and they would also take seal skin and uh, make a water make the frame that the men would make for the kayak they would they would sew that onto the kayak uh, it was the women that did that and these people were just masters of their tools and their technology and i got to read you this quote this is from rick neck k-n-e-c-h-t he's an archaeologist at the university of aberdeen and he's in a film called the people of the seal that you can see on youtube people of the seal he says, and I'm a little ahead of my game here, but I'm quoting him. He says, what the Russians found were 30,000 highly organized, superbly adapted marine hunters. And so one of the things he stresses is the men, for whatever they were hunting, they had a specialized tool for capturing or killing that prey. And the women, we're going to look at uh, some of their work in just a second here. So here is um, the uh, kayak, the Aleutian kayak. It said uh, from journals that I read uh, that I have a collection uh, from an anthropologist or a book from an anthropologist, Jockelson, who was here in 1909, 1911. He's the first anthropologist to study it. He was a Russian. Uh, he said that the most common was the two person kayak but they also had single and they also had cargo kayaks. But once the women would sew that skin on, uh, it was considered to be a living spirit and they treated it uh, special. So the driftwood is really important in this culture because that's where they get their wood for their houses and for their tools and the kayak. So this is a pretty well-developed tool. Uh, and one of the things that um, this archaeologist said is, if you look at the clothing or the the seal skin sewn onto the kayak, they're sewing, the holes are the size of a human hair. They're so tight. And uh, the work the women did is just incredible. They would live in these ulaks, 
or what the Russians would call Barabara. And what you're seeing here is one from 1906 where they've adopted some Russian culture here. You can see there uh, a window. This is on Kodiak Island, but it would be the same idea. So by, by 1906, the Aleuts had been brought over to Kodiak by the Russians. Uh, and then, of course, the Americans are there by that time. But I want to show you this. This is an old village that was on our island. And this is Joe. He's uh, a colleague. He was a Coast Guard buddy of mine. Uh, he's carrying his 30 out 6 by rule. And uh, two or three of us went out to look at this village. Um, the Aleut would look for level ground where they could get down to the beach, but they could dig down uh, to make their houses. And then they would use either whale, whale ribs or whale bones, but mostly it was driftwood to make their roof. And then they would grass or sod that over. But they had winter villages and summer villages. They also had what they called observatories where they could see the sea and the waters around looking for enemy or also looking for marine mammals. They called those observatories. And then they had camps and resource sites where they could, you know, this is where I can get seabirds. This is where I can get mussels. This is where I can get, you know, driftwood, that kind of thing, or ducks, whatever it might be. Here's an image uh, from the Park Service um, of Barabara. And this is a winter one. So there's more, there's probably three families in here. So they dig down. Uh, so obviously there's some sedimentary material here. They could dig down in the soil, take the driftwood and then sod it over, but they would enter through the roof. You can see here, again, this would be a winter habitat in the summer when it'd be single family. Uh, Dockelson, again, this, um, our anthropologist was really the first to document. That's not true because there were Russian traders that documented stuff. Um, and Bering's expedition also documented stuff. But anyway, he's the first to really study the Aleut people. So you're getting to see some authentic uh, materials here in his photographs, including their tools, their hats, and their clothing. So the women would sew a parka. And the female parka would be of puffin skin and otter fur. And the men's parka would be made out of bird skin. And you're not seeing that here. But then they have this camelica. It took a woman a year to make one of these. And these are waterproof hunting parkas that you're seeing these men wear in the upper right. And then this bottom right picture is one in the museum today. And what it's made of is the guts of sea lions or seals, and it's sewn in strips. And then there's a hood also, and this is waterproof. And then uh, here you're seeing, uh, this is another parka, female parka, the sacks. Another interesting thing is when they would make boots, they would use the neck of a seal or sea lion for the ankle part of the boot. And then the bent wood hat you can see here, uh, the previous image you saw looked just like a visor. So they had the visor or the bentwood hat. And the more elaborate it was, the more important the person was in that village culture. Okay, so that was um, some of the clothing that you saw prior to what the Russians would have introduced as clothing. So that was some of the original uh, native clothing and tools. So now we get into the discovery of the Aleutians by the Russians. And in their second expedition in 1741, there was the Bering Expedition and the Cherikov Expedition. And uh, the first to record an encounter was Bering on the Shemungan Islands, just below the peninsula. Uh, there's not much said about that, um, but the the naturalist Stellar, you know, we've seen in the news in Maine near the Stellar Eagle, uh, was named after that naturalist. He was with Bering, and he was documenting a lot of um, a lot of marine life and birds and mammals and such. But uh, the second uh, 
the, the discovery of the Aleutians. So the, the Aleuts were discovered by Bering uh, with their first encounter in the Shemungan, but that was not the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutian Islands were actually, it was September 1741. And Cherokov found what they believe was either Umnak or an Alaska Island, and Bering discovered Atka Island. And we'll see some of that later. But what happened is, well, Bering died on this trip. On his way back, he spent the winter. He died on Bering Island. Didn't quite make it back to the Kamchipka Peninsula. But uh, what happened is when the rest of the people got back, and um, one of the things to keep in mind here is otter pelts at that time were worth lots of money, like thousand dollars. So an otter pelt was worth a lot of money. Well, there was this craze that happened. Uh, all these uh, Russian Siberians heard about these pelts and all of a sudden everybody's making a boat and heading to the Aleutians. And some of these people were, were fur traders, but they didn't know anything about navigation. And one author said, it's amazing that more of them didn't die. But all these missions start going at one point by the 1760s is probably 40 different people going out, 40 different boats or 40 different expeditions trying to get pelts. So by 1745, things really get fired up in the Aleutians. Promel Sheleniki. Promel Sheleniki is a name that is given to the Russian Siberians. And most accounts, now I've only read like three or four accounts of this, but they're not very favorable. They are considered to be rough people. And I, I hate to generalize, so you never know, right? But anyway, there were enough of them there that mistreated the Americans because when they first left Siberia or the Kamchipka Peninsula and made their way to the Commander Islands, okay, they picked up the word Aleut. And nobody really knows the complete origin of that, but the the Pramalenshaniki are the ones that named the Aleut the Aleut. But when they got to further east, they started calling them Americans. So anyway, they were pretty rough. So what they would do is, a classic case is, they would take prisoners and then tell the men, go out and bring us otter pelts, and then we'll release these people. But unfortunately, the beginning of this on Act Two, they captured 15, they murdered 15 uh, to set an example that they would do this. And they actually wiped out a whole village in 1757 uh, to make a point. So they were pretty rough on the Aleut. And the Aleut were tough too. They could hunt and defend themselves, but they didn't have the same weaponry, right? So what happens is they're working their way east. And so as they use up all the resources or they're, they're using, you know, extirpating or uh, using up all of the sea otters as they work their way east, they finally get to the eastern Aleutians in the 1760s. And they're on Umnak in 1761. And they've already had some experience, but they've heard what's been going on. Uh, west of them, and on Umnak in 1761, the Aleut rise up and kill off most of the exped this one ship, but you know a, a dozen or so of them escape and go back. And on Alaska, coming a little, the next island to the east in 1762, five ships show up, and the Aleut out of 200 people kill 178 and destroy four of the five ships. So the Russians aren't going to stand for this. So in 1766, uh, this Solyev, uh, I'm butchering his name, Ivan, Ivan the Second, terrible, I guess. He decides he's going to. He gets a fleet of ships, uh, gets cannon, hires mercenaries, and he goes in and destroys every village on Umnak, in the islands of the Four Mountains, 18 villages on Unalaska, and several on Unimak Island. And what he does is he's trying to squelch the resistance and reduce the population. And if you weren't killed, you were taken as a slave. So that's what happens to the Aleut in the 1760s. 
So if they were 12 to 30,000, which are the, the range of estimates, they are now by 1766 reduced to less than 3,000 individuals. So they were pretty brutal. So the origins of the Russian Americans, some, some authors call this the Russian American company period, but the Russian American company forms towards the end of this uh, as a monopoly. But like I said early on, there are as many as 40 different people or boats going out there uh, trying to get pelts. After 1765, there are reports going back to the Royal Court of Russia, and um, there are some rules that are set down that says you have to treat the alley humanely, and you have to give them a half share in your company. Uh, but the thing is, they're also trading, so none of that actually happened. Um, 1760s, by then, almost all of, except for the Eastern Aleutians, the sea otters are near extinction. And so what happens is, um, although the Aleut knew about the Puivloff Islands to the north in the Bering Sea, they had never lived there. And so the Russians discover that there's this huge rookery of uh, seals. And so they take some of the enslaved Aleuts and dump them there and say, we'll be back for the pelts, uh, for the hides in 1786. So in the 1780s, what's happening, now let me go back uh, two years, 1778, Captain Cook from England comes and discovers the Aleutians or comes and explores the Aleutians. The Russians are getting nervous because Scandinavian countries, probably Americans and the British are starting to look around. So they decide they better create some settlements. So in 1780s, they start establishing settlements. First is called Three Saints on Kodiak Island on the south southeast side of the island. By the 1790s, the Aleuts are like employees. So things are getting a little bit better for them. Uh, and the Russian-American company in the 1790s is becoming more and more of a monopoly, and they're lobbying uh, the royal court to give them a royal charter saying that you know we can control the fur trade better and we can christianize the Aleut. so anyway in 1799 the royal charter is decreed so what happens is by the 1780s and 90s you have russian orthodox priests that are among the Aleut, and the Aleut get introduced to russian orthodox church and many of them adopt it for a number of reasons. Number one, if they get a Russian name when they get back, they, when they get baptized, they get a Russian name, and their opportunities are really enhanced. And not only that, but the priests were very helpful to the Aleuts. They fought for the rights. They actually created a written language for them, and they fought to educate them. And the other thing that the Russians did. Uh, was they allowed them to practice their culture and religion. That wasn't a problem. That wasn't a paradox for the Russian Orthodox Church or the Russians. So you can see here this image from Jockelson in 1909-1911. In nine, by now, right, they're wearing clothing they've traded with the Russians. Well, also it could be by 1909 the Americans as well. But they're wearing Western clothing and adopted a lot of uh, Western culture. So there is a change in their culture, even though they weren't pressured by the Russians, trade had a big impact and religion had a big impact on changing their culture. And again, this is from the archeologist. He says, um, the Russians took advantage of the know-how of the Aleuts as the base of their fur trade. And then once the Aleuts uh, were involved there, they were irrevocably tied to the world trade and trade goods. So not only religion, but also the culture. And you can see how it had an impact, at least here in this image of their clothing. In come the Americans in 1867 with uh, Seward's Folly. And we purchased Alaska. And unfortunately, as many of you may have experienced, uh, you are not allowed to speak Aleut anymore. You have to speak American. 
you have to speak English, and you have to adopt American culture. And so the laws were enforced. And what was sad is by this time, uh, many of the Aleut were speaking Russian. Uh, many of them spoke two to three languages, and they had positions in the Russian American Corporation. So, and they had civic uh, positions. And that all changed when the Americans came in. So I'm going to be jumping a little bit of history here to World War II. And so if you remember the movie, The Battle of Midway, we're going to, I, I'll touch on that just briefly here. But as you know, um, uh, we kind of created an embargo on the Japanese because of what was going on, what the Japanese were doing in Korea and, and China. Uh, we kind of created an embargo against them getting any oil. And in 1939, the United States, sensing there was problems uh, afoot, decided to start building submarine and seaplane bases at Sitka, which is down east Alaska, Kodiak Island up there that you saw, and then out a little bit further out in the Aleutians um, on, on Alaska. So they built these bases. Now, keep in mind, there's not a lot of airfields here, and seaplane and boat is the way you get around in Alaska in the 1930s. So on June 3 and 4 of 42, the Japanese attack, by air attack, Dutch Harbor, which is on, on a, in the, Dutch Harbor is the harbor in the town of Unalaska on the island of Unalaska. And we'll see some pictures of that a little bit later. And this starts a 15-month air war. And the reason I refer to the Battle of Midway is if you've seen either of the films or read any of the literature on it, the Japanese were uh, trying to take the island of Midway, but they were also trying to fool the Americans that they were going to go up and take the Aleutians, which they did invade the Aleutians. So anyway, that played into that. So this is all happening at the same time uh, as the Battle of Midway. On June 7 and 8 of 1942, they take the islands of Kiska. The army takes the islands of Kiska and Attu. On Attu, there's 41 people. There's a teacher, his wife, and 39 Aleut. And the teacher, when he sees the, the Japanese coming to shore, goes running for his radio to alert the Americans, and he's shot and killed. And his wife and 39 Aleut were taken prisoner back to Japan. On June 12th, there was a second air attack on Dutch Harbor, and at that point, they decided they better evacuate uh, the natives. So the 12th and 16th of June, they evacuate the Puivloff Islands, the island of Atka, and on the 13th, they evacuate eight other villages. There's just under 900 residents that are evacuated, and they're sent to southeast Alaska. Now, they're they're dropped off at an old mine, and they're dropped off at a, a defunct uh, cannery or, or fish processing plant, and they're left there and forgotten about. And it's horrible conditions. There's no privacy. There's not enough heat. There's not enough of anything. And one in 10 of them actually die there. So, um, and then on At Two, of the At Two prisoners, 16 of them die. Um, under Japanese care from disease and starvation. And sadly, I'm a little ahead of my game here, but after the war, the people on At Two are not allowed to return because they don't rebuild that village. And because the government said it was too costly. But I have to tell you, on a radio contact that I had with a Coast Guardman on At Two, he told me they weren't allowed to hike there because there's unexploded ordnance. So that could be one of the reasons, in all fairness, to the government. So the Battle of Attu takes place on May 11 and to 30 of 1943, and it's pretty deadly in terms of percentages. I mean, it's not the numbers like the Marines uh, on all these islands that they died in the Pacific, but in terms of percentages killed, it's the highest percentage uh, of killed in any uh, battle with the Japanese. And the problem is fog. So... There was a lot of friendly fire. There were Canadian Americans that actually killed each other uh, because they thought they were enemy. There's a huge um, 
suicide of the Japanese that were left. I forget how many prisoners. There was only a couple dozen prisoners that were actually taken. Most of them either died in battle or killed themselves. And while the Battle of that too was going on, the Imperial Army evacuated Kiska, so they were gone. So the Americans, when they get to Kiska, uh, that that's vacated by the Japanese. So anyway, that's um, kind of a, a brief history of the Aleutians. 1741, you have first contact, anywhere from 12 to 30,000 Aleut at the time. 1799, the Russian-American Russian, Russian -American, uh, company is definitely a monopoly. And by then, though, the population of the Aleut has been reduced to less than 3,000. The 1910 census had them at 1,500. In 1940s, Attu and Kiska get occupied. Nine villages are evacuated. And in 1971, jumping ahead, you have the Alaskan Native Settlements Claim Act, which basically extinguished all land claims by Native Americans, and they're given money. And so what happens is they form corporations. And in 1972, the Aleut Corporation is formed which we'll talk about in the next unit, at uh, the end unit. And then in 1988, the federal government paid reparations to the survivors of the internment um, down in the Southeast where they were forgotten about. So that's kind of a rough road there. Like I mentioned, um, there's, Alaska, how do you get around in Alaska? Either by boat or plane. That was before the roads. Remember, the Alaskan Highway was built by the Army to get up to Alaska because they were afraid of invasion. So there really wasn't a road prior to, prior to World War II. And so in the early 1900s, because of the marine resources uh, and all the fishing, obviously, uh, lighthouses were really important, and 16 lighthouses were built in Alaska starting in 1902. The second and third lighthouses were at Scotch Cap Light and Cape Sarachev on Unimac Island. And Cape Sarachev, where I was stationed in, in the 1900s, was considered to be the most isolated in the United States, and you signed a contract for four years. You served three years on and one year off but you could not bring your family. And so in the early days, they would have three people at the station to man the station. So, and this is the first lighthouse uh, at um, Cape Sarachev, sorry. Um, Scotch Cap Light was the first one built in the Aleutians. Uh, and again, this is at the southern entrance between the Pacific and the Bering. And so this is a, this is the second lighthouse. This is was built in, uh, oh, geez, around 1912, though. Uh, I don't have the exact, I'm, I'm thinking this photograph is from 1912. Now I'm having a a lapse of memory. But anyway, this was a, a steel and concrete building structure. You can see it's five stories. And unfortunately, on April 1st, 1946, a tsunami wiped it out and killed five Coast Guard that were on duty. Now, there were other Coast Guard here. You can't see it in the picture, but off to the right, there were several other buildings and there were radio people here because of uh, during the war, there were actually more people here. They were spotters looking for submarines and enemy shipping and that kind of thing. But after the war, they were down to five people that manned the light and the foghorn. And then there was a group uh, that uh, off to the east here, to the right of this picture, that were doing some radio work. And although those their buildings were damaged, nobody in the, those buildings were killed. So the five Coast Guard were killed here in 1946. The same tsunami went all the way to Hawaii many hours later and killed over 100 people in Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, but only one of the bodies of the Coast Guard floated back, uh, and he was buried. And excuse my gruesomeness here, but there were two feet 
and one piece of human intestine that were buried along with that gentleman. His father actually claimed came to claim his body, and he was buried um, elsewhere back home. So that was 1946. So they rebuilt that, and um, they also moved uh, Cape Sarachev up to a higher location. The Pacific side is more vulnerable to tsunamis than the Bering Sea just because of the subduction on that side. I want to talk about Loran. Now, many of you know about the Loran station in Caribou, and this is related to this. So Loran stands for Long Range, Long Range Aids to Navigation. I was a Loran technician in the Coast Guard. And in ninth, Loran A was the first navigation system. Using Loran A, you could probably be within a half a mile of your actual location. This was remarkable. It's the first electronic navigation system. And Loran A stations were established in the Aleutians on AT2, ADAC, and Cape Sarachev by 1944. And that system ran up until the 70s and was discontinued in 1977 because all through the 70s, you had Loran C that was being run up in the Bering Sea at, in the Puvloff Islands, uh, Point Barrow. And Loran C came out in 1957, but the receivers were so expensive, nobody in the public could afford them until you got into the late 60s, early 70s. When the military went to Loran C, all these re receivers were on the market cheap, so everybody adopted Loran C. And there were many other iterations, including Omega, and you all remember the Loran C antennas that were out in Caribou. That was part of that system. But because GPS became the dominant way to navigate, then they discontinued Loran in 2010. So that's the story of Loran. So that's what I did. I was at Cape Sarachev on Unimac Island. Here's the crew. Here's our chief. Uh, he served on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Point Welcome in Vietnam. Most people don't realize the Coast Guard had been in most, um, most of our engagements, uh, wars. Uh, this chief, he was injured. The, the ship was actually bombed by the U.S. Air Force and was shot up by the Viet Cong. And he had burns down one side of him from that. This is the view out of my window. This is Pogromny Volcano that you can see. On the other side of this are Westfall Glaciers. And I want to point out this uh, Jeep International, excuse me, uh, that was one of our conveyances. But we would serve for a year and you would get 60 days off. We had anywhere from 21 to 26 crew. And what we did was we took care of the light and the foghorn. We had an aircraft beacon, radio beacons. We did the weather. We broadcast the weather, and we maintained. This is a 120-foot Loran antenna. Uh, that was part of our job. Now, in addition, once a month, a crew would go down in one of our vehicles to Scotch Cap Light and maintain the radio beacon, the light, and the foghorn down there because. That became automated in 1971. Excuse me. So here is a photograph of the latest uh, Scott. This is a 70 Scotch cap light. And um, there was still behind me was a, still a building. And we, like I said, we would take the Unimog. This is a Mercedes uh, crew cab pickup. And you would drive 15 to 20 miles from Cape Sarachev South to Scotch Cap. Every five miles or so, we had these um, survival shelters in case a vehicle broke down in the winter. A crew could stay there until another vehicle came to find them. But uh, anyway, that was our, our duties uh, to maintain those navigational aids on the Unimac Pass. So again, this is the first navigable pass. So there was a lot of traffic uh, going from the Pacific to the uh, bearing and vice versa. So uh, this got decommissioned uh, in 1979, and they put in an automated light. And I have not been able to find out about the radio beacons, what happened to those. So I'm sorry I couldn't find that out. 
One other thing I want to tell you about is up on the hill above our station was an old Air Force station. These were called the White Alice sites, and they were communication and early warning system. There were 80 of them across Alaska. They would, you know, early warning for ballistic missiles or aircraft, and they used now, excuse this picture because this is modern day. This was like taken in 2019. Um, these antennae are tropospheric scatter antennae, and they could be broadcast over the horizon. And then they also, and they're gone now, they also had microwave antennae. And we were able to actually use this uh, for telephones. So it cost us a dollar a minute, and I would save up, and once a month I would call home for 30 minutes. And uh, of course, I was making a dollar twenty an hour <laughs> in 1974. So I would save up and then make my call. But all this has been just abandoned now. And somewhere in the 20 teens, they went in and dug out all the old fuel tanks from both stations, and uh, and any oil drums and things like that. But the buildings are still there, as far as I know. So anyway, let me finish uh, with this last unit and talking about the Anungan people today. And as I mentioned, after the Settlement Claim Act, the Aleut Corporation was formed, and they have six companies, ones like a credit union and that kind of thing. But also they support their shareholders, which are the Aleut people, uh, through a lot of different things. Uh, first of all, they're shareholders in the corporation, so there's some financial gain. But there's the Aleut Foundation, the Aleut Pudloff Islands Association, and although they, they do some health stuff, this is more as much cultural as anything else. Uh, they have a development a corporation, they have a housing authority, uh, they have a, a civil uh, borough, the Aleutian East Borough, and they support 13 tribes and 13 villages. So what I thought we would do is talk about what they what these people do for a living. And a lot of these people are sustenance living. So what they do is they live off the land, they'll they'll fish, let's see here. I made a list. Salmon, halibut, seals, ducks. Uh, and they will many of these people supplement their work by going to a processing plant which can be seasonal. Some of them commercially fish. Uh, there's also some fleet support industry in three towns. Uh, one is not in the Aleut uh, Corporation, but um, there's also ranching. I mentioned there's at least two islands where they brought in um, uh, caribou and also um, their sheep and, and cattle, but also guiding and trapping. So um, anyway, but a lot of sustenance living supplementing with work and keep in mind that a lot of commercial fishing is seasonal as well so here is about as far out as you're going to see people living in the Aleutians so all of the western Aleutians pretty much uh, the from the Andrew off the Rat Islands and the Near Islands are completely abandoned the last people to be on Attu Island other than visitors uh, to a monument they put in for World War II, where the Coast Guard, who basically, by, um, I'm, I'm not, I don't have the exact date on when that base was abandoned, but um, it was, it's been quite a while. So past ADAC, uh, it's pretty much uninhabited. So here are the 13 villages plus ADAC and Cold Bay which are not considered part of the Aleut Corporation, although the Navy has turned over all of its housing on ADAC to the um, Aleut Corporation. And if you look here, ATCA, we talked about ATCA earlier, uh, Nikolsky, Unalaska, Akatan, and Unga, these are original Aleut sites where the uh, Aleut villages were. The rest of these are part of the Alu Corporation again, except for ADAC and Cold Bay. So what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, these three right here, just to give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, but uh, ADAC, 
on Alaska. And uh, you can't see it here, but False Pass is in this narrow channel. Uh, those three places are where people can refuel, ships can refuel. And I'll talk about Unalaska because they have a lot more fleet support than that. So we'll zoom in here. Here's So here is where the Aleutians start, Unimac Island, the Unimac Pass. And we're going to look at Akatan, so the island of Akatan, the village of Akatan. We're going to look at Unalaska, the village on the island of Unalaska. And this is where Dutch Harbor is in the town of Unalaska. And then we'll look at Umnak, um, particularly Nikolsky, uh, these three villages, just so you can see kind of what people are doing today. So this is a um, Google Earth look at Akatan Harbor. And it has a population of 15, just over 1,500. This is their newly formed harbor uh, where they can dock, uh, I think they say here, 58 vessels of up to 165 feet. There's an old whaling station here that was abandoned in 1939. So the whaling station, I'll talk about in a second. This is the Trident Seafood Plant, and this is Akatan Village. So as you can see, there's not a lot of roads. In fact, they're applying right now for a grant to build a road from the harbor over to the Trident facility. So Akatan um, was formed or founded in 1878 as a first storage and trading port. Um, they have the Pacific Whaling Company uh, in the image is covered now, uh, was founded in 1912. It was the only Aleutian whaling company, a whaling uh, station, uh, and they were in business until 1939. But the big, big actor here is the Trident Seafood Plant. It's the largest seafood producing facility in North America. They have 1,400 company housed employees at this site. Um, they process 3 million pounds of fish a day, primarily Alaskan pollock, but also cod. They also process king crab, snow crab, and halibut. And they've developed product secondary markets for fish roe, fish meal, and fish oil. So this is a, a, a big player. But as you can see, the road network is pretty limited here. So you're getting in by boat or seaplane, in or out, I should say. So that's Akutan, and this is the second largest town in the Aleutians. Unalaska is very different. Unalaska it has a lot more beach places where you can stretch out, and also um, quite a few roads. I don't know if it's 30 miles a road, but it's much more significant than uh, you just saw. A population of just over 4,200. Trade began here in 1759 with the Russians, and uh, in 1824, uh, a, a um, Russian Orthodox priest, Father Ioan Vermerikov, he's the one that devised the Aleut alphabet. He opened the school. He translated the catechism uh, to the Aleut language. He uh, translated the Gospel of Matthew to the Aleut written language. And what you're seeing here is the Cathedral of the Holy Ascension. It is the oldest uh, cruciform-style Russian Orthodox Church in the United States. And unfortunately, this town, uh, when the villages, village was um, vacated or evacuated during World War II, U.S. servicemen pretty much ransacked and vandalized the homes, sadly. And then after the war, things were rebuilt um, with the help of the government. And then also four other villages from the Western Aleutians settled here. So it's Dutch Harbor uh, is the place. It's kind of the welcoming center of the Aleutians. It's the number one fishing port in the United States, believe it or not. They process $190 million worth of um fish every year, you know, fish, crab. There's 400 vessels that call this place home. That's how big it is. 
There's two major shipping companies with two large marine cranes. They do marine service and support. It's also the westernmost container terminal. There's a container terminal here. Uh, nothing like you'd see, you know, um, on the east or west coast of the U.S. Um, mainland. And there's five seafood processing facilities. So it's quite the town. And here you can see, uh, this is from 2017. This is the uh, bishop and the priest from Western Orthodox Church. And the um, parishioners are all in procession. They're singing in celebration of the 75th anniversary of surviving the attack uh, by the Japanese. This was uh, June of 2017. Here you can see some kids and family at the airport to welcome the Alley veterans and uh, residents that came back to visit on Alaska. So now I want to go to the last village, the smallest in the Aleutians, which um, the 2010 census had only 18 people here, but the 2020 census was 39. I don't know what happened there, but 75% of these people speak Aleut. It's the Eastern dialect. Um, the mostly sustenance living. And so again, salmon, halibut, ducks, and seals they live off of. They also have um, over 4,000 sheep, a herd of sheep, 300 cattle, 30 horses. They fish, and they also will fly out and work at the crab canneries and processing ships. But the, one of the reasons I wanted you to see this village is this village site has been occupied continuously except for the extraction during World War II uh, for over 8,500 years. There's been people living at this site. I'm I've just found that the most amazing thing. They claim to be the oldest continuously occupied community in the world. So pretty interesting. So I don't know who, who's going to challenge that claim, but somebody may. So as promised, I wanted to show you a couple of final shots here. Thank you for hanging in there. Um, what you're looking at is Unimac Island, uh, the shoulder of Pogromny Volcano. This is at three o'clock in the morning. I went out to take the weather. We had to take the weather every three hours. So I'm looking a little north of east. And this is the caldera that I talked about, Fisher Caldera. This is Shishalden Volcano. It's a smoking volcano. Doesn't always smoke, but almost every other time I'd see it, there'd be some smoke. And off, so this is the dead center of our island. Uh, we're looking, I'm looking almost due east, not quite. And then on the far west end of the island is Ishkintox Peaks. You can see those two peaks, which makes it pretty unique. And so anyway, there you go. That's looking east. I'll turn and look into the Bering Sea. You can see a ship heading back to the harbor, and this is looking over the Bering Sea uh, to sunset. And then my final slide is the only uh, Westerner that I know that's buried on the island is William Rosenberg. He was a lightkeeper here in 1915 and decided that he wanted to be buried here. I don't know how many years he served. I couldn't find that out. But again, I'm looking west, and you can see a, a it's not Akatan, Akun Island uh, on the other side of the Bering Strait. So with that, I will quiet myself and see if you have any questions. Well, thank you all. all really right, appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank good night. you. Good night. Bonsoir, bonsoir. Okay.